Uh, Bruce, I, you had you had talked to me before about post-war. She was still really developing her, with working with child dolls, and the, and when she wanted to start to move into fashion, she turned the child doll. Um, basically, she transformed their body by the way she would stuff the you know bust the, put bust in the clothing, but also then slowly the face evolved too. And you want to talk about that? Right. Well, this is the the doll that um, she chose. It was used for. Uh, the Benny, and for Winnie Walker. And when did that come out? Uh, these were... 49, 50 in that period? More like, I think, 52, 53, 54. Okay. Um, so it was a mold she already had. She'd been working with it. And I think part of the strategy was she was using something that was already familiar. So. Something we'll see over and over, Madame Alexander or the Alexander Doll Company was not big on introducing new molds. So for, to do a new, a new mold for them, that's a big deal. However, to rewig a doll, to change the facial, the makeup details, those were things that they could do. So the, the mold then was transferred to Sissy, but there are several little nuances to make her look, uh, to, to do that transition to a slightly older doll, a uh, teenage doll. So one thing that they did, I think is very clever, is very subtle, is they took that sort of apple um, cheek detail of the blushing, of the blush that's kind of almost in the center of the doll's face, and they moved it down just a hair, and that gives uh, Sissy more of an adult look, and then the uh, it's fascinating. I can see that the the sure. sh the the shadow the shadow is not always consistent, but um, the shadowing became a little bit uh, heavier. So a lot of these things just very fascinating to uh, people that are just totally in a sissy world, so to speak, is some of the nuances that transition as sissy transitioned, because she was definitely evolving. Um, as a doll, almost every, every year of her existence, uh, there was a major little tweak, sometimes not so little, as the doll evolved for uh, the market that it was in and uh, because technology was changing too. So um, I, when I started working on these, I kept coming across the phrase of the different finishes and the two that were that seemed to keep popping up at me, and I didn't understand what they were until you finally explained it to me, was infused and painted. And can you point that out, what the difference is, what, what that means, and what, how people can distinguish? Well, the first... Um, and which is, which is considered more desirable? That's really a, a personal preference. Okay. And they have, however, they have definite pros and cons, so that partly... Um, defines the, the choice that people make. Now this would be an example of a painted finish or any of the, uh, the earlier hard plastic dolls because the hard plastic that they were starting with is kind of an ugly gray color. So the doll got what was essentially um, pancake makeup, which um, for instance, those 1951 dolls which would have been fairly early in the development of hard plastic, they are very heavily made up. As the dolls progressed, that um, painted finish became a little bit more refined. And then Sissy came along. Um, and again, it was... Uh, you looking for an early Sissy that would have an example well, of... Here's one. Now this is infused? This is painted. Painted, okay. So this would have been 55, 56, and the first half of 57. 57 was a transition year. But the doll has almost like a, a cosmetic uh, layer of, uh, of pancake makeup. Then the uh, cheeks, uh, lips, brows, and if the doll has eyeshadow, uh, that's added. And then the final coat is a very thin coat of sealant. 
And the sealant is what gives that doll a um, that sort of matte bisque. Sometimes it's described as a, as a bisque finish. When all that comes together, especially if the doll is really mint, it is really a beautiful finish. However, part of uh, the reality is if it, the doll is played with at all, that sealant rubs right off and you get what you see uh, so often on the painted finish dolls. They have a, a very shiny underneath once they lose the sealant. Mm -hmm. The coat, the face is very shiny. So you see that much more then you see that, say, a doll like this. So to find a beautiful example of right. one like that is all is gives it a really precious aspect. Absolutely. These are kind of, you know, when collectors are deciding rarity points. Oh, leave her out. I want to talk about her hat for a minute. Uh, <laughs> when when collectors are talking about rarity points for a doll, that's when you can find one with a beautiful uh, finish like that. Then that would be that would be a rarity point. That would be an absolute premium for a. Um, the earlier dolls, the painted finished dolls of 55 through mid uh, 57 would be very, very desirable. And Trudy's, I think, are almost all like that. So the hat on that doll. I have two other things I want to say are Emile Jumeau, Beatrix Alexander. Number one, the evolution of the child face to the fashion face. With Emile Jumeau, it was almost, he did almost exactly the opposite. In the 1875-76 period, he had his very, very beautiful, one of his most beautiful fashion dolls, Poupées, um, introduced with a gorgeous face. And shortly thereafter, in 1877-78, he introduced his Bebés, and the first Bebé face was actually that Poupé face with a few changes. Eye sockets cut a little larger, like a child would have bigger eyes, and a few other subtle changes like that, but basically the same model. So, kind of the same thing that that Beatrix Alexander did. People tend to forget in doll history that they weren't making dolls for us to collect today. They were running a business, and they had to use what they had. They had to economize. They had to find all sorts of ways that could make it profitable for them to still produce a beautiful object, a beautiful doll, but use the assets that were available to them. So I liked those comparisons. And the other one, and this is just a funny little offside, but her incredible hat. I love that hat. You're going to tell us about it in a minute. But I want to tell you, in about 1890, okay, so she's in the 1950s, about 1890, um, there were a series of French, um, not really automatons, they were like mechanical toys, and a very popular one was the bunny in the cabbage. And it was a, a paper mache cabbage covered with leaves similar to her petals on her, um, on her hat, green leaves of a cabbage. And when you wound it up, the, it, the top separated, all the leaves separated, and the bunny popped out of the cabbage. So here we have the same technique of the flowers being used. And while we're diverting, but I think you should because you have two incredible examples of hats right there in front of you, Talk again about that hat and the hat on the wonderful, that girl in the sheath, okay? I know we have a company rule that Theory Alt employees cannot collect dolls, but if I collected, she would be living in my home, the beautiful sissy in the sheath. So talk about those two for a minute. I do want to say one, add one thing to what you were saying. Um, when a manufacturer, whether it's Jameau or uh, Alexander, introduces something new, they don't, you don't know if it's going to be a success or not. So you're really rolling the dice, hoping oh, for the good best, point. That's a very but good point. you could lose your shirt. But anyway, um, this is kind of a fa one of those great examples of sometimes this doll referred to as secretary, sissy secretary. Um, it's one of the few times that sissy wears black. Um, she, especially as a street dress, there's a couple or at least one A-line uh, with a first doll evening gown, but Sissy's more likely in street dresses to be a navy uh, taffeta, but she's wearing black, but what makes the outfit is the hat. And the hat is, part of its fascination is that it's an exact 
duplication of hats that were popular at the time. Doing big overscaled flower petal hats was really, was a thing. And that's what uh, Madame was uh, duplicating for Sissy, something that was part of her world. She may even have had owned one herself. Yeah, with the many photographs we'd see of her, it wouldn't surprise me at all if she had. But I'm willing to bet because I have the advantage that a lot of people don't have of I have so many dolls that pass through my hands that I can very often make a preliminary judgment on the rarity of a doll by have I seen it before. And I haven't seen that hat very often. I haven't seen that costume very often. Well, the hat gets separated a lot mm -hmm. and it can get so squashed that it really looks horrible. But this is a wonderful example. It was probably made in the studio. They most likely, someone um, worked on these petals um, themselves. It probably was not something that they were able to find. A lot of uh, things that were used on, on hats, little trim details came from, the, from 7th Avenue, which was the fashion district um, at that time. It's still there, but it's more likely to be boutique hotels and, and chic restaurants. Well, maybe not so many restaurants now, but the, <laughs> the, the neighborhood has changed a lot. So the story is that she used to haunt the, um, the fashion district looking for um, sometimes bolt-end or pieces that would be the quality that she wanted, but that she could buy at a, an economical price to costume her dolls. Those are true stories. Oh, that was a definite real thing. So, and that was a constant challenge for her to, because the end bolt concept gave her a way of having some just extraordinarily beautiful fabrics that uh, she didn't have the quantity to buy an entire bolt, which would have cost a fortune for one thing. And then she would have had to make, say like Ideal did with Revlon, where they had to make literally thousands and thousands in the same dress because they were selling to a, a totally different market. But um, jumping to this doll, it's probably one of the the most interesting that uh, uh, Madame did. Turn so they can just, just leave it on the table, but turn it so they can uh, so again, see it from all sides. She's in black and she's wearing the other twin of fashion at the time. Most of sissies are in a uh, small waist, big skirt. But the other fashion look was uh, pencil skirts, sheath dresses. It was a totally different um, silhouette, but it was harder to make it work for Sissy. And this is fascinating that she decided to take, uh, take on this uh, concept. It doesn't show so well because it's it's all in black, but this uh, is draped in front. And uh, it's hard to know what her influence was, but this doll came out in 58. In 57, there's a famous photo in Vogue magazine of Balenciaga, who introduced almost the, the twin of this in one of the, the really, uh, a beautiful photo spread. His had black gloves and, and a, a different hat. But again... Um, How should the hat be worn? Is it a, ba a back frame like that or does it rest on top of the head? Um, probably should be a little bit more like this. Okay, because I love that flower on top. No, isn't that great? But this is one of her uh, really, uh, for a street dress, this is really one of her I think the thing that people can't see, it's the same reason they don't show a lot of black clothes in mail order catalogs today, because you can't, in photography, really pick up the swirl, the drape on the front of the dress the way it's made, and that is a really important thing. And I know you want to talk about her jewelry line, 
for dolls, and you could start with her because she has, I can see, one, two, three, four pieces. Now she, another detail on this dress that you have to see the doll to appreciate is the little uh, beaded details that are uh, uh, part of the dress. But one thing is fascinating with Sissy, and uh, you see, now a lot of the ball gowns have kind of more formal uh, uh, diamond jewelry, which was, of course, rhinestones. But a lot of the street dresses use something that was um, new and, and very uh, creative at the time, which was costume jewelry. Costume jewelry was something that was exploding in popularity and in design options. So um, sometimes there are sissies wearing a, <clears throat> a beaded necklace, which seems maybe to our eyes out of scale, but actually Madame was, was reflecting that, those big beads, which were, again, it was a, <clears throat> a thing in fashion at the time. But um, Sissy will have uh, um, some of her jewelry are wonderful, uh, a wonderful reflection of some of the fashion well, what, just point out, and the camera can pick them up with some of the wonderful, um, I mean, the, the girl in the yellow gown in the back, that particular necklace is always very, very stunning. Well, this is really um, intriguing. This is an example. This is a 1955 doll. <clears throat> and one thing that's interesting in the 55 dolls is she sometimes did things that she never would do again because maybe it was too much. There were pro problems in production and maybe it was too expensive to use. But anyway, they only did it the one time. And she has jewelry um, details that were probably, again, all done in the studio using um, the, the topaz stones and the, uh, for, both in the necklace and in the earrings. But um, again, like I said before, it was something that was only done that one time, and it must have been very time-consuming to, uh, to knock that out. And you might want to talk about her jewelry. I want, one of the things I noticed, um, and I'm, I'm going to shut up, but I wanted to point out this particular thing, was she really made use of a style that's kind of popular today, with a lot of designers like St. John, for example, that they almost incorporate jewelry into the item itself in the, in the form of a very decorative button or in the form of a clasp that needs to be part of the costume when you put it on. And you can see that in her belt, for example. I'm just pointing out different pieces of that, but look at her amethyst bracelet to match her uh, costume. Yeah, this is... a. Again, it's not something that they did. A, Madame did a lot, but sometimes uh, the uh, stones matched the costume. So again, some of these, for instance, that little detail, that's probably a, a, a millinery, a little millinery detail, and a lot of these little pieces would become um, incorporated in, in different aspects of the, uh, the doll costuming. But she also has something that's very interesting um, are these little plastic purses, but in fashion terms, where they developed was the uh, um, introduction of lucite. And lucite purses were a huge thing uh, for uh, young ladies and, and women in uh, mid-century fashion. They came in different shapes, different sizes. Of course, what you had in them then <laughs> became um, important, but Sissy got you a number of them. You could carry an old ham sandwich, right? right? You, you know. <laughs> Unless you wrapped it in a fancy handkerchief. Yeah, um, the details of your life became, uh, could be scrutinized. And again, as far as hats, this is another uh, really super uh, grand um, statement. And again, I'm Part of my theory is these are kind of some of the details that her husband probably contributed, having such a um, kind of unique understanding on the design and, and, and what worked. 
because the uh, there's so many different elements that are part of the hat. One is the beautiful uh, Italian straw, which is very fine and, and shapes uh, really well to the doll's face. Of course, the the flowers themselves, which um, you know they used a just the most beautiful quality millinery uh, flower, and then the uh, uh, the tool, which when it's tied, it frames the, the face really beautifully. So you have these different layers of fashion, and uh, this would probably be something would be perfect for spring, maybe early summer. But it's really interesting how um, things were considered in interpreting the doll into the time of year that it would be would have been appropriate for. So the hat, the cotton, and the uh, and almost always a beautiful called either polished cotton or cotton sateen with that wonderful lustrous finish. Earlier you were talking to me, and I think this is important, and again, this was the same thing that the doll makers of the 1800s knew was such an important thing, scale of design on the fabric. It was always easier to work with a solid color because you didn't have that problem, but if you were going to have a, a pattern on your fabric, talk about that. Right, well, the, the solids were much easier to work with because you didn't have to match up prints. And if you ran out of one navy blue taffeta, well, <laughs> just pick up another one. The prints were much more challenging, so they had to find the scale, and they had to have uh, the quantity to do a run. When they got their orders in, and they then knew how much they were going to produce of a particular doll, that's what they were basing the, the quantity of their fabric on. So that was a little bit tricky because they did not want to get halfway through production and then run out. If they did, they would just substitute something that was similar but different. But over and over, um, the, one of the things that you notice with Madame Alexander and Sissy, uh, not just Sissy, but uh, the scale of the prints being appropriate and how challenging that must have been to find the right scale uh, on a doll scale. Now, going back to something we talked about earlier, look at her complexion, infused, <clears throat> infused or painted? Oh, infused. Okay, infused. <laughs> so tell me, what does that mean? In uh, mid-57, uh, Madam of the Alexander Doll Company switched Sissy from painted finish to an infused. Mm -hmm. Now, some dolls, say like Elise of uh, Sisset, they were only produced as infused dolls, but Sissy came out a little bit earlier, so um, they made the decision that everything now is going to be infused. So now the color skin tones are in the plastic. The uh, cheeks are still airbrushed. The eyebrows, eyelashes, the lower lashes are hand-painted, and lips. The, the lips are done with a stencil. Mm -hmm. And then the whole thing is finished off again with that, uh, uh, that very thin layer of... Uh, so the difference between, I'm simplifying it, but the difference between infused and painted is mainly the complexion, not the features. Correct. 